I'm Pete Blather, a member of OSHA at Dartmouth Summer Lecture Series Committee. I am excited to bring you a session from last year's series entitled Critical Thinking for the Preservation of Our Democracy. As you may remember, we used a debate format in 2019 and had two speakers for each session. In general, one speaker spoke on one side of the issue or issues, while the other speaker took the opposite point of view. Today's session is on voting rights, and the issues discussed are as relevant today in this election year as they were last August. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 outlawed all discriminatory voting practices which denied people the right to vote. Nevertheless, some states have enacted practices that can potentially suppress voter rights, such as ID cards, residency, re residency requirements, purges of voter rolls, and gerrymandering. Our first speaker today is Debo Adegbayo, a partner at Wilmer Hale Law Firm. Debo earned his bachelor's degree from Connecticut College and a law degree from the NYU School of Law. From 2001 to 2013, he served on the NAACP Legal Defense Fund as counsel and president, presenting oral arguments before the U.S. Supreme Court on two land landmark civil rights cases, successfully defending the constitutionality of the core provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. In 2016, President Obama appointed him as commissioner, as one of the commissioners for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Our second speaker today is Bradley Smith, a professor at Capital University Law School. Bradley earned a bachelor's degree from Kalamazoo College and a law degree from Harvard Law School. He is a James Madison Fellow in the Department of Politics at Princeton. In 2000, he was nominated by President Bill Clement, Clinton to fill a Republican designated seat on the Federal Election Commission, where he served for five years and as chairman in 2004. He is considered one of the nation's leading authorities on elections law. Please enjoy today's discussion, after which we will have updates from both our speakers. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you uh, for this event and to talk a little bit about something that I find to be so important, which is our democracy and the state of voting rights in America. Um, to, today, I want to I want to do a couple of things, and it's always helpful, I find, when you talk about voting rights, to set the context of how we got to this present moment. It, it's easy to sort of focus on today's stories, but not to drill into uh, the underpinnings of how we've come to the debates that we face today. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that context, take us on a little quick ride forward, and then um, see some ways in which today's debates and fights, wars as some people call them, really have their underpinnings in our history. So as I think about it, uh, America is in many ways um, an idea. It's an idea and a commitment to an idea that's powered by votes and powered by the citizens' votes. Framed another way, and as the language of the preamble captures it, America is an aspiration. We the people in order to form a more perfect union. As I read those words, it's not a statement that we are perfect, but that we can get better. And the Constitution is the framework through which we move forward, through which we engage in our democratic processes and try and make the nation better. Now, there's no person, no serious person, no reasonable person who maintains that the Constitution, as it was originally crafted, had taken us all the way that we needed to go. There were some serious defects in our original Constitution. There, there were concepts of treating some of our citizens as less than equal. We didn't give equal protection of the laws to everybody and counted some persons as less than a full person. We didn't contemplate voting rights for, for women and African Americans. And so these are just two examples of the work that remained to be done at the founding. We, we in the Constitution, we made high promises, but we knew that we had more to do. So from that early period forward, I would like to sort of think about the way in which the journey has taken us forward and, and where we've had to pause and stop along the way. In this framework, I'd like to, I'd like to sort of think about a particular 
um, idea. And that idea is that in many ways there are, as you've heard, two ways to win elections. But before I explain to you what, what I think those two ways are, I just want to throw out some of the quotes about voting and its centrality, because that's one of the issues that we'll be debating today, that some of our leaders have offered, um, many of which are around the same Voting Rights Act of which I'll speak. In the, in the words of President LBJ, if this noble view of the rights of man was to flourish, it must be rooted in democracy, the most basic right of all was the right to choose your own leaders. John Lewis, known to uh, many people in this hall who bravely fought for the Voting Rights Act and bled and was beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, said the vote is precious, it's almost sacred. It's the most powerful nonviolent instrument or tool we have in democratic society. People must understand that people were beaten, arrested, jailed, and some were murdered while attempting to register to vote or to get others to register to vote. And finally, upon signing the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, Ronald Reagan said that the right to vote is the crown jewel of American liberties, and we will not see its luster diminished. And so those are big words. They're important words. They're words that make us think about the possibilities of, of the democracy, but we also have to think about what they mean on the ground what democracy looks like as it's practiced. And today, I want my focus primarily to be on those points. And so as we move to, to those points, I want to lay out for you what I think the two paths to winning elections are. These are tested through time, and I think that the paths are lenses through which you can consider both the historic debates in the time of the civil rights movement and before, and all the way up to the present debates that are happening in this state about access to the polls. Here's my take on the two paths. Uh, there are two ways to win elections. One, through addition, through mobilization, through persuasion, and through advancing policy positions that get people excited and get more people out to the polls. Uh, there's another way to win elections, and that's through subtraction. That's through trying to reduce the number of people who can participate in the democracy. Um, another way to think about it is that there is a high road in American democracy and a low road in American democracy. And I want us today to think about the various efforts to block people's attempts to vote, to put laws in place that make it harder to vote, and to consider whether or not you agree with this proposition whether or not there is democracy through addition and subtraction. Let's move for a second now and, and talk a little bit about how we got here. So in many ways, the fight for voting rights is one of the most important civil rights fights in American history because it is one that defines uh, a core piece of citizenship. In, in a democracy, if you don't have the right to vote, in many respects, you're not fully counted as part of the whole. And so the fights that came after the um, Reconstruction period when amendments were passed to try and equalize and re rebuild and reconstruct the Union, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, many of them were focused on this notion of full participation as equals. That's when we got the concept of equal protection. That's when we got a specific uh, protection to um, enable African Americans to vote without regard to race um, or, or previous condition of, of servitude. These protections were great and important, but again, they were words on the page. And so with these protections were important provisions of these very amendments that were the enforcement provisions of the uh, Reconstruction Amendments. They said not only that we have this idea that we articulate as part of equality, we're going to vest Congress with the power to make sure that the promise is kept. And Congress did and enacted a series of legislation. There was a very early act in the Reconstruction period, the Ku Klux Klan Act, that, that tried to attack threats of coercion and the like that were directed at African American voters. But the experience that brought us forward to the Voting Rights Act and the passage of the Voting Rights Act and all of those images in Selma, Alabama, and across the Deep South, what that showed is that the words on the page were not self-executing. Even the early enactments of Congress were not self-executing. In many parts of the country, they were honored in the breach 
and so many Americans were not allowed to vote or participate. In the fight, and I, I recommend to those of you who haven't seen it, there's, there's a great series about the civil rights movement called Eyes on the Prize. And there's a segment of that Eyes on the Prize series that's called Bridge to Freedom, which is specifically about the right, the, the effort to pass the Voting Rights Act and the movement in Selma, Alabama. And in that clip, in that segment of Eyes on the Prize, there's a young man who's now a, an, an older man uh, who bravely walks up to the courthouse with a number of African Americans trying to register them to vote. This is before the passage of the Voting Rights Act, and he's met by law enforcement um, wearing a helmet uh, with arms on their side, and he very eloquently explains why he's there presenting himself and his uh, fellow citizens of Alabama to register to vote, and he's threatened and told to retreat. And he stays there bravely, knowing that he's risking his life by staying there and demanding his right to vote. And he explains why it's central and why he has the right and wants to exercise it. On, on tape, um, the officer, Sheriff Clark, um, then punches him in the face and, and makes him bleed. And, and C.T. Vivian, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch because C.T. Vivian barely retreats at all. He stays there and very calmly says that he's prepared to bleed for democracy. He's prepared to die for democracy. And the reason that this clip is so significant is not only because of the um, resoluteness of this gentleman, uh, C.T. Vivian, who was trying to tell America that we had to live up to its promises. It's also significant because that same sheriff was the sheriff that would lead the assault on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on the nonviolent marchers. And that bridge was chosen by the civil rights workers and the folks in the movement. That particular place was chosen in part because they knew of the barbarism of Jim Clark, and they needed to show the world what was happening in Alabama. And they knew if they marched peacefully that he would react in that way. And so the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the march that caused Lyndon Johnson to go forward before a joint session in Congress and ask that the Voting Rights Act be passed, it came from people putting themselves in harm's way from risking, from risking their lives. Many people came down there and were killed. And so what is the Voting Rights Act? The Voting Rights Act is the bill that was passed out of this movement. It has many provisions, but one in which I've been engaged and one that I've defended, including in some of the cases that were mentioned earlier, was a provision that was designed to dislodge a pattern that happened in voting in the Deep South. Here's the pattern. There would be a discriminatory voting measure. Lawyers would bring a case to dislodge the, the voting measure, and they would spend a lot of time litigating the facts of the case, and they would get a ruling from a court that said, cut it out, you can't do it, it's illegal, it's unconstitutional. There would be various ways in which the court would issue an order. And then the people on the ground would take the order, and then they would find a new mechanism, a new way to achieve the same discriminatory end through a new door. And this happened over and over again. And so there was a part of the Voting Rights Act that was directed at some of the parts of the country that had this history of repetitive violations that was designed to put in place what was called the preclearance system. The preclearance system was designed to say, look, in certain places where discrimination has been the most virulent, the most repetitive, the most adaptive, we're going to have a different rule. The rule is going to be that you can't change your voting procedures and worsen the, the position of minority voters until such time as you come forward and show that the measure is not discriminatory, that it won't worsen the position of people to get to the polls and vote. That was the rule that was in place, passed as part of the Voting Rights Act. There were other provisions in the Voting Rights Act that applied nationwide. This one was focused on some of the places that had the worst histories of discrimination, and it proved incredibly effective. Why did it prove incredibly effective? Well, because none of these laws could go into place. Under the old regime, the law would go into place. You'd have to litigate for a long time to try and dislodge the bad law. And what would happen in the meantime is elections would happen. Incumbents would be elected. They would vest with the power of those elections, and it would be very difficult to unring the bell. People that might not have been elected, may, maybe would never be serving, were holding offices, exerting power, deciding what our democracy looked like on the strength of these discriminatory practices. The preclearance provision changed all of that. It said that unless you can show that it's not discriminatory, it can't go into place. And so it also created a powerful disincentive to do the wrong thing. Why? Because your homework is going to be checked. 
the, the federal government's going to look, and if you're doing the wrong thing, it's not going to take effect, and you're going to have to go back to the drawing board and do it again. So in some ways, you're wasting time if you're fooling around. You need to come to it and be serious and, and, and be fair in your voting laws. And so it had both a blocking effect for discriminatory measures and a deterrence effect and was very important. As you might imagine, in our democracy, and I, I'm going to do something that is probably ill-advised, but I'm going to, in a, in a town that belongs to uh, uh, the great University of Dartmouth, <laughs> belongs might be a strong word, but the, home, the hometown of, of Dartmouth, I'm going to invoke a Harvard historian. His name is Alexander Kesar. He wrote a book called The Right to Vote, and his fundamental um, tenet in this book is that everybody thinks that American democracy is an inexorable march forward, that we started in one condition and that we always march forward and things always get better. And what Alexander Kesar, from carefully chronicling this, demonstrated is that that's not the case, that the right to vote in America is a series of ebbs and flows, that there are in increases, that there are expansions of democracy under his findings, usually after war efforts, which was an interesting finding that he had, when people are going to defend the flag in various places and then coming back to demand that they be full members of society, but that what happens when you have those expansions of democracy, very quickly there are trained efforts to turn back the clock and to focus on these things. That was another thing that the preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act was designed to do. It was designed to stop that so you couldn't keep trying to go around the back door and worsening the position of, of minority voters. And so with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, the game changed. But because this provision was directed at trying to dislodge especially virulent racism in the Deep South and some other parts of the country, Congress gave it a time limit. They said, we're not going to put this in place forever. We're going to have periodic check-ins to see if it's still necessary. And the cases that I argued in the Supreme Court were about these periodic check-ins. Congress would go back and look and take an analysis of what's happening in many parts of the country and determine whether or not these protections were still required. And in 2006, 2005, 2006, Congress reauthorized this provision of the Voting Rights Act, and the core finding was a great deal has changed and things are much better, and this act is helping us. And registration is up, voter participation is up, but two things can be true. We can make progress and we can still have further to go, and there can still be dis efforts at discrimination. And that was the story that was before Congress. But immediately after the act was passed, um, those of us in civil rights know that this is the way it goes. We've already heard that in, in Professor Grebe's frame. Uh, the democracy is contested, and so cases were filed challenging the reauthorization of this important provision of the act. And so the case comes to the Supreme Court on the 100th day of the Obama presidency, an interesting time to have a Voting Rights Act challenge, the first African-American president. And so the question was there. It was in the room. In light of all this progress, in light of an African-American president, do we still need these protections? Why do we still need these protections? And the answer was that Congress had taken a careful assessment, had looked around, and let me tell you some of the things they saw were happening. In Kilmichael, Mississippi, a, a locality that had a large black population, where the black population had increased, so they were beginning to exert political influence, rather than conduct the election, the county officials canceled the election for fear that the rising minority population would have an opportunity to have an impact at the polls. Another case that was before Congress in the record, which many of you may have read about, Kilmichael was sort of a small town in Mississippi. It's unlikely that many of you heard about elections being canceled for fear of democracy um, taking its course. But you probably heard about the LULAC case, which was about the statewide redistricting effort in Texas. This was the one where members of the state legislature fled the jurisdiction so that they wouldn't have a quorum in order to pass a, a redistricting bill, and they were hiding out in Oklahoma, and uh, planes were scattered, and officials were sent to try and retrieve the officials, and this was what folks called the re-redistricting. Uh, Texas had already done a redistricting plan after the census, but now the partisan control of the legislature had changed, and so the people in charge of the legislature wanted to redistrict again to further push their influence and draw the maps in the way that were advantageous. And so that case went to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court said in turning away the plan, the redistricting plan in that case, um, Justice Kennedy having the opinion for the court, was that just as the Latino community was preparing to exercise its political power and its voting strength, uh, they were cut off at the pass. And the effort was to reduce their influence through the manipulation of the redistricting process.
And so there was lots of evidence, 15, 000, we don't have time for 15,000 pages, but the idea was that there were these continuing efforts to lessen the power of minority voters at the polls. There were many jurisdictions, many states, that in every decade since the passage of the Voting Rights Act, all the way up to the 2000s, had their redistricting plans blocked by the Section 5 preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act because the discrimination continued. So there were two stories. Progress, yes. Acknowledge it, claim it, embrace it, but also more work that had to be done. And Congress was capable of holding those two ideas in its head. Um, the Supreme Court was less persuaded, it's fair to say, um, as we stood at the podium and asked some, some pretty um, direct questions about whether or not we still needed these protections. Ultimately, in the first case, as you heard, the Supreme Court did not strike down um, the act. There was a second case. Same issue comes back a few years later. I had the misfortune of being at the podium for that case as well with the Supreme Court with personnel that had changed slightly. Um, but in the first case, there was a, a, a legal off-ramp. There was a way for the court to decide the case without reaching the constitutional is issue. In the second case, there was no legal off-ramp. The, the court was confronted with the constitutional question about whether or not Congress had the power to, to reauthorize this preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act. And, and the challenge came from a, a place in, in Alabama, Kil um, Shelby County, Alabama. And the argument was very, very vigorous, to say the least. Uh, Solicitor General um, Don Verrilli was at the podium ahead of me. Justice Sotomayor asked my adversary, who was there from Shelby County, she said, you are the quintessential example. Your client is a client whose jurisdictions have had, have had their efforts to change voting laws blocked by the very statute that you're here saying we don't need anymore. So she, so she said, as I see it, you're the example of why we have the act. I'm not quite sure why you're here asking that we declare it unconstitutional. Um, there were other justices that had different views. Uh, Justice Scalia said at that argument that um, it was well documented that the Voting Rights Act was a um, perpetual racial entitlement, um, which, which was a very difficult thing for some people in the courtroom to hear, including John Lewis, who had bled on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He was in the courtroom that day. And so the idea that an act that was designed to enforce the Constitution against discrimination was, was uh, hard for some people to abide. In that case, the court struck down the core provision of the Voting Rights Act. And so what happens on the other side? Immediately, immediately, within hours, jurisdictions that had had a number of efforts to pass restrictive voting laws um, blocked under the regime that I've just described, they say they're coming back, they're going to they're gonna bring new laws in place. That day, within hours of the decision, Texas brings the most severe um, photo ID law um, that, that was known to the nation at that time. They claimed that it was similar to other vo uh, photo ID laws that had been passed in other states, uh, in Indiana and in, and in Georgia and other places, but it was more stringent than those. Uh, it, it, well, it also was irrational in some ways. It didn't allow state IDs like state college IDs to, uh, to, to be valid as your photo ID. It didn't allow some state employee IDs. It didn't allow uh, some federal photo identification to be good for voting. It did allow gun licenses uh, to, to be okay for voting. And so people were, had a little bit of a quandary about exactly what was going on, and then there was, there was litigation over this, and what they showed is that it was going to have a, a disparate impact on minority voters. And there was a ruling of the court, both that it would have a, dis, a, a disadvantageous impact on minority voters, but also that it was enacted with intent to discriminate against minority voters. That case went up and back. The legislature changed the law at various points. Ultimately, a version went into place, but after these rulings to block it after long litigation. North Carolina is an even better example, another jurisdiction that stepped up on that day. That state, as you know, was very hotly contested in recent elections, 2008 election, 2012 election, and so on. And after the result in the 2008 election, uh, there, there were members of the legislature that started to think about what was the change in the electorate that had allowed President Obama to carry the state. And so they went through very systematically to see what were the ways in which um, minority voters had exercised the franchise. What did they do with early voting? What did they do with respect to registration? And they, they put out what was a bill that systematically went through and identified every type of voting that was disproportionately used by minority voters 
and they reduced or, or eliminated, drastically reduced or eliminated those avenues, and then they left in place other, um, uh, other channels for voting that were more used um, by, by other members of the citizenry. And that was, I, I say that not because it's my view, but because this case was litigated, and the court opinion said that they had targeted minority voters with surgical precision. Now, I remind you that had the, voting, the piece of the Voting Rights Act that had been in place until the court struck it down and declared it unconstitutional, this never would have happened. What happened in the meantime were there were a whole series of elections in North Carolina where people were being elected and, uh, and these laws were in place until a case was litigated over many years and then it was stopped. And so these are the issues that happen from time to time, but let me tell you about one more. There was an issue in Texas. Um, this was an issue about student voting, which may be on your mind. It was a case decided in the 1970s and the question in the case was whether or not students at Prairie View A&M, a historically black college in Texas, could vote um, based on their residency at their college. And the Supreme Court answered yes. That that's the case that gives students the right to vote um, in, their, in their college towns, as it were, while they're there and have an intent to remain during, during their time in college. It, this was decided in the 1970s. The reason that that case is interesting in some ways is because it brings together two things that are happening at this very time in this very state the history of people targeting minority voters because this issue arose where there was efforts to suppress black voters that were at Prairie View A&M, but it also brings together the larger issue of lots of places, including perhaps New Hampshire, that are passing laws to make it more difficult for students to exercise the franchise. And, and that's an issue that you know about, that you're reading about, that people are continuing to litigate about. And the thing that these cases have in common is that the people that are passing these laws, the people that are advocating for these laws, are making a choice about what the way is in which they think that they should win an election. Are you trying to win through subtraction or are you trying to win through addition? Are you trying to win by committing? There's a commitment that we make in a democracy, and it's a very important commitment. And the commitment is we commit to lose sometimes. People don't talk about that very often, but that's inherent in a democracy. It's a commitment to play by the rules, and sometimes you'll lose. And then the way you win is to do better next time. We teach our kids about this when they're on the ball field or in other ways in life. We teach them that sometimes you're going to lose, and what you do when you lose is you think about why you lost, and you get back and you find a way to win. You don't then change the rules to make sure that the players that were great on the other team can no longer play or show up. You don't cut their tires and make sure that they can't get to the baseball field. That's not what we teach. And so it's very important as we think about these different measures and the way in which they're happening today. Here, here, here are a couple more. Florida passed a ballot initiative. It went to the citizenry about whether or not the rules of felon disenfranchisement should be relaxed, whether people that have served their time can have an opportunity to vote after they come out. This is a big issue in the country for lots of reasons, not the least of which is that um, felon disenfranchisement has a disproportionate effect on African American communities. One of the issues, not the only issue, one of the issues having to do with enforcement um, of, of criminal laws. And sometimes the prohibition in voting extends way beyond the incarceral period. And so the question is, once people are out back in society, don't we want to have a situation in which they're invested in the polity and moving forward to participate? The voters of Florida in an election said, yes, we want to relax our felon disenfranchisement rules. And then what happened? Just recently, the legislature comes back and adds new laws and regulations, adding to the, to the measure such that you can't participate in, in the election under the new um, constitutionally passed measure, unless you've paid all manner of restitution and every nook and cranny, it's very much um, consistent with the, uh, with the pattern that we've seen. Again, that is a place where that effort to go back on the move forward would have been blocked by the preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act, but now it needs to be litigated. And so um, I, I, I leave you with, with this thought about, about this pattern and, and, and two other places where we've seen it. In Georgia and in, and in Kansas, election officials were running for office. And here are some in, in the midterm election. The state, the state chief election officials were seeking office, different offices, but high offices. And so they're both the, the umpire in the election and a candidate in the election.
And so let me tell you about some of the things that happened in those places. In Georgia, among other things, a, there was a mobilization effort in the election, and there was a group of elderly African Americans that were on their way to the polls that were detained and, and, and prevented from going to register to vote. Uh, on, on some cockamamie theory about, uh, I don't even know what the theory was, but there were, there were re repetitive efforts to try and narrow the mobilization efforts that were happening in Georgia. Those are being litigated now, but again, after the election and after the result. Under the old regime, this could not have happened and it would have been blocked. In Kansas, in Kansas there's a small county that has a high Latino population, a very high Latino population. And so what happened in that county? They took the polling place that was in town and they moved it 14 or 15 miles outside the city center to a place that doesn't have transportation um, before the election and uh, to make it very difficult to vote. Now, in fairness, this is not a place that would have been subjected to the preclearance provision, but the, this is one of the difficult things about the Shelby County case. It's not only the places where it took away the protection, it's the signaling effect. It was the signaling effect of the retreat from the democratic minority inclusion principles for which so many of us have fought. There are two ways to win elections. One is to mobilize and to add voters. The other is to deter and to be afraid of the results and try and block people from voting because you don't have sufficient confidence in your position to carry the day and you're willing to do that. I would like our nation to commit ourselves to the high road and to join each of us on that path so we can get in there and prepare to know that sometimes we win, sometimes we lose, but we never cheat. Thank you. Thank you for that thunderous applause. Oh, that was for that. <laughs> No, uh, it, is a, it is a pleasure to be back here in the Granite State uh, and uh, to see you all. And I think it's a, a, a great thing to see uh, that so many people have, have come out on a Thursday morning. It's a good sign for our democracy that people care and are willing to, to do that. I'm the bearer of good news today. Um, and, you know, I think, as I say, that folks coming here shows that, that there's not a complacency about our democracy. And yet, in a way, uh, it, it is a bit odd that we have this issue today and that these issues have become uh, so heated and controversial because by almost any measure, it has never been easier to vote in the United States and voting has never been more widespread than it is today. In other words, we are making progress and we're making a lot of progress. And the question is, where do we go next and, and, and what do we do? And the battles of the past can certainly shed light on our history and how we got here, but they don't always answer the question as to where we should be going and, and how we should be uh, getting there. In 2018 midterms, we had the highest midterm turnout in decades. We had the highest turnout of Asians, Hispanics, and African Americans since they began keeping those numbers. Um, in several recent elections, African-American turnout has for the first time exceeded white turnout. So there are many reasons for tremendous optimism and for asking, you know, does this vision rooted in uh, the 1960s and 1950s Deep South truly answer our, our questions today? We have record high rates of registration. A lot of this is due to the Voting Rights Act, one of the most successful pieces of legislation in American history, a great piece of legislation that really did do a tremendous amount to fulfill the promise of the post-Civil War amendments, of the Civil War itself, and, and of the nation's founding. But today, in addition to the Voting Rights Act, we have all kinds of other things that were unheard of just two decades ago. No-fault absentee balloting is uh, very, very common now in most states. Just two decades ago, that was virtually unheard of. You couldn't do no-fault absentee balloting. We have early voting in a great many states, vastly extending, extending the time in which people can vote. We have provisional ballots. Two decades ago, none of you had ever heard the word provisional ballot. People like me who were teaching election law were vaguely and barely familiar with the concept 
of provisional ballots, and now they're required across the country. This is when you show up and you don't have a required identification, or you're in the wrong precinct, or you're not on the voter registration list, or what have you, and you are allowed to cast a vote anyway, and it will be examined afterwards, or you can bring in further documentation and so on to show that that vote should be counted. So in most ways, voting is, is, is at its peak. And as Dable says, that's not a reason to quit, right? Of course not. But it is a reason to, to ask ourselves, okay, does this, what's representing reality here? What is more representative of reality in this particular point of time? Now, I briefly want to address Shelby County, just to say one or two things quickly. I mean, I think the Supreme Court's view in the Shelby County case was the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, and this preclearance provision went to certain areas based on criteria from the 1964 election cycle. Right? What was the voter turnout? What was voter registration? And, and you know, did the uh, area have certain things in place to try to suppress voting and, and so on? And on this basis, a number of states were included. And then when the act was extended, a few other criteria were added in 1970 and, and uh, at the next extension in the mid-1970s. Okay? Uh, by 2006, this criteria was 42 years old. And note that it only applied to some of the states. Now, a lot of people say, oh, the Voting Rights Act was repealed. No, the Voting Rights Act was not repealed. Most of the Voting Rights Act remains intact. You can sue anybody, any, well, you know, anybody who violates the law is subject to the act. You can sue anywhere in the United States for violating the Voting Rights Act. Okay? If somebody violates the Voting Rights Act, if they suppress votes, they can be sued. So what was uh, limited was this preclearance provision, which did not apply to all the states. It applied only to some states and certain parts of other states around the country. And the court looked at this and said, you know, this is kind of odd that we have a regime in which some states are sort of treated as less than others. They can't act, enact their own laws without first getting the U.S. Department of Justice to say it's okay to do that. And the court had originally upheld this, I think quite appropriately, on the grounds that, you know, look, we're trying to break the back of discriminatory practices. And these are where the problems lie. In 2006, the, the Congress extended this act for another 25 years to 2031, meaning that states would still be judged on their 1964 performance, almost 70 years later, as to whether they could enact their own laws. And the court essentially said, uh, you know, we know you've prepared this lengthy, voluminous record, but essentially we don't think you're, you're really making the kind of cuts that, that you need to make, and that to some extent this is kind of pretextual, this long record. And the court has done that. Very recently, to great acclaim, the court held that the Trump administration could not add a census question uh, or a citizenship question to the U.S. Census on the grounds essentially that the administration had the power to do that, but they had to offer up at least their, reason, their real reasons, and the reasons they were offering were pretextual. And in a sense, Shelby County is somewhat the same sort of thing. That, that latter decision on the census got a great deal of applause from American liberals and from many voting rights activists for various reasons, uh, the, whether this citizenship question is asked can be important. Um, because the court was willing to look behind the stated reasons. And in a sense, that's what they did in Shelby County. And they essentially said, you just can't keep 1964 forever in the criteria for treating some people differently than others. Doesn't work that way. And the court had warned Congress, actually, in that earlier decision, the day but one, that you have to start thinking about this. And of course, Congress could have changed this criteria. There's a time, if we, if we want to put the, uh, say, the, the great defenders would be the Democratic Party, there was a time in which the Democratic Party had overwhelming majority in the House, filibuster-proof majority in the Senate, and the U.S. presidency. And it chose not to alter these definitions, despite having received a warning from the Supreme Court on it when they took that off-ramp instead. But they said when they took that off-ramp, they said, boy, we don't see how this, this stands if you, if you don't change this. Okay, so the, the preclearance provision was, was altered, but it's not clear again if we look at the kind of turnout numbers that I pointed out that it's really creating any sort of, of major problem. And again, one can still sue under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act for discriminatory practices. So we have to look at what is again our situation today. 
Now let's talk about some of the other ideas of what it means to be inclusive, to take this high road, to rely on persuasion. Does that mean that we should be able to watch a film about a major presidential candidate in a presidential election year? Or can that film be censored by the legislature? Because that's the Citizens United case that so many people hate. The legislature wanted to censor that film. And that's the film that so many people say, yes, that's a terrible decision. That film should have been blocked. They should not have been allowed to pay for that film and to show it. That's what Citizens United would have meant had it gone the other way. Now, is that persuasion? Is that the high road? And maybe we need to think some of these issues become a little more difficult when we start to think about it. Does the high road of persuasion mean that you have the right to criticize or to praise people, to voice your political views without fearing retribution aimed at the economic health of your business or violence against you or your family? Because that's a real issue now in the United States. It's becoming an issue. There's a joke going around now, you know, a U.S. official and the Chinese official are debating and the U.S. official is criticizing the Chinese government that they need to respect human rights and the, and the U.S. official says, you know, in my country, we can openly criticize the President of the United States without fear of retribution. And the Chinese official says, well, in my country, we can openly praise the President without fear of retribution. <laughs> okay. And there's some truth in that nowadays, right? And many of the same people who are arguing, well, we need persuasion, are also arguing that if somebody voices opinions you don't like, they should be harassed, hounded, fired from their jobs, right? They should have picketers in front of their house chanting death threats against them. They should be subject to Twitter mobs. Their business should be uh, boycotted and have pickets out front. So what is persuasion? And what is the high road? And these are difficult issues. I think we find uh, that, that if we really want all voices included, we need to include all voices. And we need to recognize that we will disagree with some of those voices. But we try to change those by persuasion, not by threats of economic or physical harm. So to take it back more directly to, to voting, um, let's ask uh, uh, some other uh, points here about some of the things that have gone on and some of the claims that are being made. I want to start with voter ID because to me this is uh, uh, one that I have very uh, kind of mixed feelings about. I'm not a big fan of uh, uh, voter ID. Uh, for, I've spent much of the last decade uh, telling my conservative Republican friends that voter ID doesn't really do much to prevent fraud, and there's not really a lot of fraud in U.S. elections. Now, there is fraud. Uh, there is. I mean, there's no doubt about that, but, but it's not a, a major, major problem. And to the extent there is the type of fraud that can be uh, prevented is not usually prevent, prevented by, by voter ID laws. Um, having said that, there's precious little evidence that voter ID laws are actually depriving people of the right to vote, right? At least that they're not much evidence that they're depriving more people of the right to vote than they are preventing fraud. And of course, that's sort of the balancing test that one has to make. Because a fraudulent vote dilutes a vote, destroys the value of your vote, just as much as being not able to vote, right? It's a long recognized constitutional claim that you can't dilute votes, which you can do by stuffing the ballot box with fake votes or having people vote who aren't entitled to vote. And the reason that these voter ID laws have been upheld in state after state across the country by the Supreme Court in Crawford v. Marion County and by most lower courts across the country is mainly because the plaintiffs haven't been able to bring a case. They haven't been able to identify people who actually can't much vote. In Indiana, in the Crawford case, the, uh, they eventually came forward with a woman named Faye Buish Ewing. Uh, she was the you know, quintessential plaintiff, perfect. She was an African-American woman born in the Deep South in the Depression in the 1930s. Birth records weren't always that good. She said it would have been hard for her to come up with an Indiana ID that would have satisfied the requirements to be able to vote. Looked like real proof that at least one citizen was, was being deprived of the right to vote. Until people began looking into the case of Faye Bowie Ewing and discovering that she owned property in Florida, claimed the homestead exemption in Florida, which is generally for people who consider themselves a resident of the state, had a Florida driver's license and was registered to vote in Florida. So maybe she wasn't eligible to vote in Indiana after all. And maybe the ID requirement, in fact, prevented that. Whether that's the type of fraud it was aimed at or not is, is another question. Right? So this has been a problem. 
they had another group, uh, they, a group of nuns in Indiana, and they all went down proudly to vote, and they didn't have the proper ID, so they were all turned away, and they all said, well, we couldn't go vote because we're nuns, we don't have cars, we can't go get licenses, and so on. Um, but again, it turned out that uh, it was kind of showmanship. People had specifically offered them transportation and the assistance needed to get the IDs, and they had chosen not to get them because they wanted to go down and show that they were being deprived of the right to vote. Well, if you're trying to show that you're being deprived of the right to vote, you're probably not being deprived of the right to vote. You know, if you're going out of your way to make sure you can't vote, I don't think it's, it's fair to say that you've been disenfranchised in any particular way. So a dozen years ago, I wrote an article in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review that I thought that voter ID contests were essentially uh, much ado about nothing. As a policy matter, I myself don't really favor the laws, but as a constitutional matter, I think that, that the plaintiffs have simply failed to show that there's a real constitutional violation here. And I wrote, as I say, that it was much ado about nothing. Thus, I wasn't surprised that, that uh, there was a study uh, released earlier this year by researchers at the University of Bologna in, in Italy and by uh, people at, at Harvard, um, reviewing over 1.3 billion, with a B, observations of voting. And the conclusion, this is for the National Bureau of Economic Research, I say by, by uh, researchers at Bologna and Harvard, quote, we find the laws have no negative effect on registration or turnout. Overall, or for any group defined by race, gender, age, or party affiliation. These results hold through a large number of specifications and cannot be attributed to mobilization against the laws measured by campaign contributions and self-reported political engagement. ID requirements have no effect on fraud either. Much ado about nothing. Actual or perceived. Overall, our results suggest that efforts to reform voter ID laws may not have much impact on elections. Okay? And I think that's pretty much what we've seen uh, in the United States. I mean, it certainly supports the anecdotal observations and the fact that, as we see in case after case, the courts are ruling that the plaintiffs just haven't been able to carry their day. The court, the Supreme Court in Crawford did not say that you can never have, uh, that voter ID laws are always constitutional. It said that essentially you've got to prove your case. That the plaintiffs in Marion County case hadn't done that. And I think that continues to be uh, the case today. And that, in some ways, is, is, is the best case for those who are arguing that our laws are now depressing, that there's this massive voter suppression going on. You know, one of the things, for example, is early voting. So in Ohio, they enacted 35 days of early voting. And then the legislature decided maybe they'd cut it back to 29 days of early voting, and they were sued. This was vote suppression now. This was discriminatory to reduce early voting from 35 days to 29 days. Now in 2000, nobody had ever heard of early voting. Early voting, what's that? You vote on election day. Early voting, what do you mean early voting? Right? And this is not just in Ohio, this is nationwide. Most of you are old enough to remember this, right? You didn't have early voting. Now all of a sudden it's unconstitutional to reduce early voting from 35 days to 29 days? Now why would the legislature want to do that? Well, there's many reasons why they might want to do it. It starts to take us to thinking about what, how we should be thinking about voting going forward. You see, voting is a very precious right. I totally agree with Dable on that. It is, it's, it's tremendously important. And it's important not only for its role as electing a government, but it is important as a symbolic measure of our political equality, the fact that we treat each other as political equals at this core level of voting. Right? When we go into the ballot box, we're equal here, and we all have that right to vote. At the same time, voting is a power that we exercise over other people. Voting can be used to protect our liberties, but it can also be used to erode the liberties of other people. After all, these Jim Crow laws weren't enacted by judges. They were enacted by voters and voters' representatives. Right? And many, many laws that have deprived people of their rights and freedom over the years have been enacted through voting. So when we design voting systems, we want to think about what gives us you know, what, what purposes do they serve beyond just the idea that we're politically equal and if enough of us get together, we can deprive other people of their rights? Okay. And how do we do that? What are some of the things we do? If we think about early voting, we might think about a couple things. For example, although most people in elections vote in large urban areas, right, most elections in this country are for tiny little offices. Township supervisor, county clerk, you know, village clerk, that sort of thing. 
And that's what most people are voting on. And in most of these elections, people are not spending big money. They're spending little money. You live in my town, in Granville. It's named for Granville, Massachusetts. Some of you may know where the original settlers came from. Very New Englandy kind of town. We even have like a little village of green and stuff. Um, if you uh, uh, want to, uh, where was I here? It, 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 in Ohio, if you're in, in Granville, if you're running for village council, if you spend 500 bucks, you're really blowing the bank. I mean, you are you are like the big money candidate. You're like the Koch brothers running for office here. Okay. You don't start campaigning until about three weeks before election day. You send out one or two mailers, and typically these are paid for out of the pocket of the candidate themselves. Well, if people start voting 35 days before the election, they often haven't heard a word. One of the arguments against early voting is, well, wait a minute, everybody should have sort of the same amount of information. Okay? Well, the response is, the people who vote early tend to be the hardcore partisans. They know who they're going to vote for. They know today who they're voting for in the presidential election in 18 months. They know today who they're voting for in the Senate race in 18 months. But that's not true in these local races, which are often nonpartisan, so they don't even have a party designation on. They don't even know who's running at this point. And they go out and they vote 35 days before, and then the candidates go around knocking on the doors, and people say, I'm sorry, I already voted. I would have voted for you if I'd known. So there's an argument that maybe we want to shrink that voting period. Of course, a longer voting period means it costs more if you're concerned about money in politics. You've got to reach more voters. You've got to reach them earlier. That's the big thing. You've got to reach them earlier. You can't aim all your mobilization toward election day. You're, the election season is stretched out. The cost is raised. There's also, for some of us, a sense that, first, there's no evidence that, that early voting or vote by mail has increased turnout overall. But for many of us, there's also a sense that one of the reasons it might not be increasing turnout which has an additional negative reason, is that it destroys the idea of voting as an important community experience, as something we share together, as a moment when we come together, as equals to decide on our political future. Instead, we do it kind of much more kind of privately by mail-in voting that we fill in at our kitchen tables or we go out to, to, to vote, uh, you know, in a tiny little group on a Saturday because they've opened the office for early voting and so on. There's something to be said for the idea that on election day, we go to the polls and we see our neighbors and we, and we line up and we get those little I voted stickers and so on. We say, this is how we do something communally in a democracy. So not only is it a, something that breaking that sense of community down may, you know, offset any other gains you'd get by making voting easier, and that's why you don't increase turnout, right? But also that in, the, in addition, we're destroying long-term our sense of community in the sense that voting is an important exercise, and what is it that we vote for? Why do we vote? Why do we care about that vote? Why is it so precious to us? And we're destroying that. But it was attacked as being unconstitutional discrimination, lost eventually uh, in the Supreme, or in the uh, Sixth Circuit here. We have uh, an another question of purging voter registration list. Now, if we should have voter registration at all, and some people might doubt that we should, but that's a separate debate. If we're going to have voter registration at all, presumably you need to occasionally purge the list. Another case out of Ohio, this is viewed as discriminatory, anti-voting, the low road. What did Ohio do? Well, if you didn't vote for two years, and remember Ohio has elections every year. There's elections every year, odd years and even years. If you didn't vote for two years, and includes primaries and general elections, so you've got four chances at least in a two-year period, more if there's a special election, and you didn't vote, they would send a notice to your registered address with a pre-addressed or pre-stamped postage paid return card. If you didn't return that card saying, yes, I still live here, I want to vote, then if you didn't vote for another four years, they would remove you from the voter rolls. Which didn't mean that you couldn't vote, it just meant that you had to go register again, make sure you were registered and up to date. This was prosecuted as being discriminatory. The Supreme Court rejected the challenge. Now, I just don't think, and maybe it's just me, I'm just not going to compare this to being punched in the mouth when you're trying to register at a site in Mississippi or Alabama 50 years ago. So we shouldn't pretend this progress is illusory and be ratcheting up things to suggest that everything we have going on is of a constitutional dimension. Now this sounds like the gloomy view, right? The grim view. But this is the good view. 
This is the positive news. Like I say, I'm bringing you the good news. This is what we're fighting over now, whether we can have 35 days of early voting or only 29 days of early voting. This is what we're worried about and having these huge battles over. And we have the gerrymandering, or the, the case from Texas, Dave will mention, where they redistrict it in mid, mid-decade. And he suggests this is like changing the rules. But of course, what were they doing? They were, over, they were changing a highly partisan gerrymander that had been enacted, been enacted in 2001 by the Democratic-controlled legislature. So all these people now, oh, we hate gerrymander, we hate gerrymander. Well, that's what they were doing. They were saying, well, we're going to over, overwork this gerrymander. That's, what they, that's why they did the mid-decade redistricting. Okay. So there's a lot of things that go into this stuff. It's not so simple as we're the high road, we're for persuasion, but we don't want to hear about, you know, a documentary movie about a presidential candidate if it's paid for by somebody we don't like. We're not that much for persuasion, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a much more complex issue than that. And it takes us back to that question, where do we want to be going forward into the future uh, in our society here? I think uh, I'll raise one other issue, student voting. Let's talk about student voting since that issue came up. Where should students be allowed to vote? You know, if you want to sue in federal court, if you, have, you can go sue in federal court if you have a federal question, something based on a federal statute or a constitutional provision you're claiming has been violated. But if you don't, if you just have a breach of contract action, a slip and fall tort or something like that, and you want to sue in federal court, you have to show that the citizens are citizens of different states, the two parties, the plaintiff and the defendant. Okay? We have a rule that determines what state you are a citizen of. You can't just say, well, I was born and raised in Massachusetts, but I'm attending college now at Dartmouth. I think I, for, for my, uh, uh, the party I'm suing here is also from New Hampshire, so I want to be in federal court. So I'm going to be a Massachusetts citizen today. You can't do that, right? We have a rule that determines what state you're a citizen of. Now, the rule has a lot of flexibility to it. Uh, it it's very fact-specific, but it is a rule. There is a rule. We can have that for voting. Again, one envisions lots of small towns. Lots of colleges are located in small towns, right? In, in my small town, we have a college. Uh, a year ago, I was not there. I was off visiting elsewhere. So, but uh, we they have a tax measure on the ballot, right? The tax measure won by something like 27 votes, and the student precinct carried by like 200 or 300 votes. A lot of the people in the town are like, wait a minute, we just got a tax increase imposed on us by a bunch of people who've been here for a year and have no intention of ever staying here. Right? And we don't think that's right. Now, we're not trying to deprive them of the right to vote. We're just saying if you don't plan to live here, you remain a citizen of where you came from, which, by the way, is the rule for federal getting into federal court with your lawsuit. Okay? That's basically the rule for getting into federal court. So why don't we have that rule for voting? And by the way, there's a number of other things. For example, Dave will point out, well, you know, in New Hampshire, I guess there's now legislation to require driver's licenses. So most states have that. Most states have a rule, which is you know, not widely enforced because most of us cheat on it when we move. You know, but most states have a rule that if you move to the state within 30 days, sometimes it's 60 or 90, you have to get a state driver's license in that state. Very few people do. They keep their old state license until it expires in seven years or whatever it is. But that is the rule. And you can be ticketed for it. You can be busted. It's just that usually there's no reason to bust you for it. Nothing comes up. But these students don't go comply with that rule. In Ohio, all these little villages have income taxes. How's that, huh? You wouldn't tolerate that up here in New Hampshire, by God. But we have not only have state income tax, all these, even little villages like mine, we have an income tax, and it's 2%. It comes off the gross. There are no credits, no deductions. It is the ultimate conservative fantasy, right? Postcard. What did you make? Multiply it by times 0 0.02, send it in, right? That's the flat tax fantasy world. That's what we have. And it applies to all your income, no matter where earned. So if you go home in the summer as a student and you earn income, you've got to pay village income tax on it. Are the students doing that? Not much evidence that they are. After that last election, some people began compiling all this stuff, you know, they're neurotic about trying to show that these students were voting and they're not really Ohio residents. They're not complying with the other indicia of Ohio residency. Is that really unfair? Is that terrible? Is that disenfranchisement? So again, it takes us back to thinking about what is the purpose of voting? Do we view voting as a, as a sign that you're part of the community? in which case these students ought to be getting driver's license, paying taxes, and otherwise living in the community.
And that's how we, we ought to think more inclusively about what voting is and why voting is important to us, why we restrict it to citizens. We don't have to do that. We haven't always done that. In the past, years ago, a century ago, Americans used to allow immigrants to vote. We can do that again. But that's a legitimate debate about what is voting about and, and why do we include or exclude certain people. And that's the fair debate that we should be having and that we should be looking at. And so I think, you know, I'll conclude by just saying when we look at it that way, we have a lot of pluses going for us. Things are really good, right? There are things that can be worked on. I've spent a lot of time, like I say, talking to Republicans and saying voter fraud is not that big a problem. You really shouldn't, these voter ID laws, you really don't need them, right? How many Democrats are out there talking to their people privately or publicly and saying, you know, voter ID laws really haven't been shown to discriminate, to, dis to prohibit, you know, to keep many people from voting. They're really probably not that big a deal. I don't think there are very many doing that. There aren't very many Republicans doing what I'm doing either, so I don't want to mean to be like I'm, you know, Mr. Clean Hands here, but, but it works both ways. We can't be constantly trying to ratchet up the idea that we're in a crisis of democracy when in fact, in many respects, our democracy has never been stronger, particularly in terms of the right to vote. And in fact, perhaps the biggest threat to our democracy is ratcheting up all of these what are relatively minor complaints in the great scheme of things to the notion that we are in a great constitutional crisis. Because that's when we do foolish things, when we think we're in a crisis. That's when we do foolish things, whether it's restricting the vote or whether it's doing other things that might damage our voting, such as excessive early voting. Right? That's when we make mistakes. So let's be positive about our democracy, work to make changes where changes is necessary, but recognize that there's a lot of good news out there and we shouldn't let our policy be driven by bad news and we shouldn't let our politics be wrenched apart and setting us at war by claiming that people who are, are you know, trying to engage in massive voter fraud or trying to suppress votes, when really what we're just doing is arguing about important concepts, but concepts that are really at the margin of an issue that has really been decided, which is that all Americans do, in fact, deserve an equal opportunity to vote. Thank you. Hi, this is Brad Smith. When Dave and I first discussed this issue a year ago, I noted that as a matter of both law and as a matter of fact, it has never been easier to vote in the United States, and we've never had a broader franchise in our history. Also, we should point out that we've rarely had a time in which there was so little fraud in elections. In these circumstances, it has not been wise, I suggested, to have uh, rampant talk about voter fraud as if this is a, a, a major new problem. And it has been a mistake to use provocative language such as disenfranchised or vote suppression when we're talking about small changes at the margins that people often want to make for a variety of potentially legitimate reasons, whether one agrees with those reasons or not. To talk simply about good guys and, and bad guys and people who want to persuade and people who want to oppress is to really, uh, I think, trivialize some of the sacrifices people made for the right to vote over the years in the United States. Uh, oftentimes we're talking about things like no more than reducing the number of days for early voting from say 35 to 28, something early voting that we never even had uh, until very recently. We didn't have provisional balloting until recently. We didn't have no-fault absentee balloting until recently. Now, today, you know, less than a year later, we face a major new challenge in carrying out an election under the threat of the COVID-19 virus. And for this reason, uh, we should expect far more mail voting than in the past. Even if no changes were made, uh, no one-time changes to voting practices in the states, because uh, most states now have no-fault no absentee voting, and a lot more people will take advantage of that uh, to vote than in the past. This creates a lot of problems. People think it's easy to switch, but actually it's not. States that have gone, the, few, the handful of states, about five, that have gone to all male voting, note it's very difficult. It took a long time to transition. Voters need to be educated much more than you think. For a lot of people, it's a very uh, a frightening or a new process, or they're confused about it. They don't know if they still have to go to the polls, how they vote, when they vote. Uh, you also need added poll training, particularly in the task of signature verification to make sure that mail ballots coming back in uh, match the signatures in the polling records. You need, uh, in many cases, new equipment to count these ballots. You need to make sure that uh, voter uh, lists are up to date. 
uh, particularly at places where people may be voting in person if we're switching around polling places because we've got to move things out of, out of schools out of, uh, and in particular out of uh, senior citizens' homes, out of assisted living facilities, and so on, where there are high-risk populations. So it's going to be a very, very tough election. In this environment, I would just say that, again, it would be behoove us all to approach this recognizing that we really live in a golden era for voting. Uh, and we should grant a little bit of good faith uh, and a little bit of leeway to people in office who are making decisions they've never had to make before in an unusual situation and trying to decide how we're going to carry out the 2020 election. It is not good that both of the major party candidates have already said that if they lose, it will probably be due to fraud committed by their opponents. In this kind of circumstance, we're sort of ripping ourselves apart, uh, giving our, ourselves a sense that our own elections are not legitimate, when really uh, we can do quite a good job here. So very little has actually changed in terms of the status of the, the law of voting. The question is really what we're going to do in this COVID-19 scenario. Uh, jurisdictions need to make plans and they need to be making them now, which I have argued in online symposia and in written columns. Uh, we need to be planning now for this election, uh, try to make it as smooth as possible. But again, all of us as voters should have a bit of good faith. We should recognize that one of the things about living in a democracy is sometimes you lose uh, and you lose whichever side you're on. And the good thing is that there will be another election. And in the United States today, we know that that next election is very likely, as long as we don't panic and, and again, tear ourselves apart, that very next election is likely to be in an environment in which the franchise, the number of people who can vote, the type of people who can vote is greater than it's ever been in American history, in which it's been as easy to vote as any time in the past. And if in 2020, it is, can be more difficult because of the changes, because of reduction of in place polling places. If people have to take on a little bit of a health risk to go vote, we should recognize that that's unfortunate, but it's a sign of the times. You can't have a perfect election in the best of times, and it's going to be nearly impossible in COVID times. But one of the things that uh, shows how valuable voting is, is that people in this country and all around the world have been willing to vote in times of emergency, under physical uh, threats, threats of retaliation sometimes, or threats of, of another sort. We need to remember, for example, that in New York, they were voting, literally going to the polls in a primary election on September 11, 2001, when terrorists flew planes into the Twin Towers. So we can handle this. Let's approach it with good faith, and magnanimity toward everyone. And I think that we'll have a good election in 2020. Thank you. This concludes today's session. Next week, the session will be on cybersecurity, and the speaker is Chris Inglis. Have a great day. <laughs>